He-Man and Masters of the Universe. Warlord of Eternia. Skeletor, Lord of Destruction, stood on the highest peak of Snake Mountain and gazed across the rolling landscape of Eternia. Out there were his enemies, the King and Queen of Eternia, and their allies, the Masters of the Universe. Skeletor's war against the forces of good was never ending. Each time victory seemed within his grasp, something went wrong. Far below, Skeletor could see a band of his slaves laboring at some task or other. That is my mistake, he exclaimed. It is I who do all the work in my fight for power over the planet. I protect those miserable creatures as any good slave master should. They do nothing. They are not even grateful. Skeletor made up his mind. He would no longer fight alone and would recruit a vast army from among the slaves of Snake Mountain and the trolls, orcs, gnolls, and other evil beings over whom he was lord. That very day he sent out a summons to his people to gather at Snake Mountain for the coming campaign. They crept out of the dark caverns of the ice mountains, the thickets of the vine jungle, the wild sand dunes and shattered rocks along the shore of the Sea of Rakesh. They crowded around the base of Snake Mountain, squabbling and fighting among themselves. Skeletor looked over his rabble of an army. Then he sent for Zodak. You have served me well in the past, he said. Now is your chance to do me even greater service. Turn that wretched rabble into an army. They need discipline and training. You will give it to them. Zodak worked hard, but it was not easy. At last he drew up his forces to be inspected by their evil master. Skeletor stood on a rocky ledge and looked down at his troops. Banners flying and weapons at the ready, they roared out a greeting to the Lord of Destruction. Skeletor raised his hand for silence. Together, he cried, we will defeat once and for all, those puny beings who dare to call themselves the king and queen of Eternia. Soon, Eternia will enter a new age. One planet, one people, one leader. Forward, cried Skeletor. We march immediately on the royal palace of Eternia. In a long column, Skeletor's army moved out from Snake Mountain. In the royal palace, King Randor and his council already knew that Skeletor was planning to lead an army against them. The report said that the enemy had made camp and taken up positions about five miles away. Under cover of night, the Eternian royal forces set out, and before dawn they were lined up, ready for battle. In Skeletor's camp, Zodak raged at the soldiers. Despite all his training, they still fought among themselves. During the night, there had been rioting in the camp, and now, as the sun rose, a fearful sight greeted them. In perfect formation, the army of Eternia faced them across less than a mile of open ground. Banners flapped in the breeze. The sun shone on weapons, but not a man moved. With perfect discipline, they waited. Zodak began shouting orders. His troops ran in all directions at once. Some had lost their weapons. Others had forgotten what company they belonged to. At length, they were in some sort of order, lined up facing the enemy. Skeletor rode up on Panthor. He took up his position in front. Now, he cried, is your moment of glory. We shall drive these weaklings from the field like frightened sheep. Charge! But even as he spoke, a squabble had broken out among the trawls, and some of the orcs were trying to sneak away without being noticed. Skeletor drew his sword. 
He held it aloft. He was on the point of giving the command to attack when, from the Eternian ranks, the royal trumpeters sounded the charge. In a moment, the Lord of Destruction's mighty host was a screaming mob in full retreat. And almost no time at all, Skeletor stood alone amid a litter of dropped weapons. Another trumpet call drew Skeletor's attention. King Randor had ridden out from the ranks of his army. He called to Skeletor. Admit you have been beaten. Give up your foolish struggle and let all Eternia live at peace. Never! screamed Skeletor. This is just a beginning. Mark my words! And, shaking his fist at the king, he mounted Panthor and rode back to Snake Mountain. For weeks, no one dared approach the Lord of Destruction. Alone in his lair, he brooded on his failure. His army had scattered. Zodak had been banished in disgrace to the sulfur mines. Only Evil Lin remained at his side. Why am I served by cowards and weaklings? Skeletor muttered. There was a time when I could have led a host of mighty warriors to certain victory. There was a time when Eternia was young, said Evil Inn, when all Eternians were warriors. Those were the days of the warlord of Eternia. Skeletor shook his head. I would give anything to have such as those under my command, but now that is impossible. It might not be, said Evil Lynn. There was a time when the people of Eternia traveled through time itself as easily as we travel across the planet. The secret has long been lost, but if it could be found... Well, said Skeletor, if you could journey back to the days of the warlord of Eternia... You could have your pick of the fiercest warriors our planet has ever known. Old wives' tales, shouted Skeletor. You tire me with your chatter, witch. Go and leave me in peace. After Evil Lynn had gone, Skeletor began to think about what she had said. Might not there still be somewhere records of time travel? Skeletor went down into the secret caverns of Snake Mountain to find the ancient parchments, stone tablets, and books. Some were written in forgotten languages, but many held strange secrets of the ancient Eternians. In a dark corner, hidden by dust and cobwebs, Skeletor found an ancient iron box. Inside, he found sheets of yellow parchment covered with figures and strange symbols. In the flickering light of a lantern, Skeletor began to read and gave a shout of triumph. I have it, he cried. The secret of time travel is here for the taking. Skeletor returned to the upper levels of his lair and sent for Evelyn. I need your help, he said as Evelyn entered. You were right about time travel. I need you to help me make the calculations. Can't your faithful computer help? asked Evil Lynn. No, it can't, witch, snapped Skeletor. These ancient figures are too primitive for it to understand. It needs someone with a simple brain. That's why I've chosen you. He took the sheets of parchment from the box and spread them on the table. Then they started work. From time to time, slaves crept in with food and drink, but the calculations went on all that day and into the night. The floor of Skeletor's chamber was covered with paper as the sun set and shadows crept across Snake Mountain. Skeletor sat back and looked at Evil Lynn. Well, witch, he said, that's it. We have the answer. Evil Lynn looked at her notes. Yes, she said. We now have the coordinates of one of the forgotten time corridors. We also have time factors worked out. All that we have to do now is to find the place and calculate the hour. Skeletor crossed the chamber to a large map of Eternia. The coordinates make the place here, in the desert, he said. Of course, said Evil Lynn. The sands of time. 
I've heard strange tales of them. Time vortices that drag people back into the past, never to be seen again. Ridiculous fairy tales, snarled Skeletor. Our ancestors controlled the time corridors. Fools and simpletons were afraid and made up these legends. Skeletor began to plan his journey back into the past to recruit warriors for his fight against the powers of good. He decided not to go alone. Evelyn must be there, as she understood time traveling, and he needed a fighter in case they ran into trouble. He would take Beast Man. A few days later, the three evil companions boarded a hover car and set out for the desert and the sands of time. They reached the edge of the desert, and as the hover car sped across the sand, Evil Lynn checked their position. We must be at the entrance to the time corridor by evening, she said. The time vortex we need is activated by the rising of the moon. If we are late, we shall not have another chance for a month. Skeletor brought the hover car to a halt close to the edge of a wide, rocky gully. We'll walk the last few yards, said Evil Lynn. She led the way as they scrambled down into the gully and out at the other side. A faint moon glow was in the eastern sky as they came to what seemed to be a flat slab of rock half buried in the sand. This is it, said Evil Lynn. They saw that the rock was really an area of rough paving. It formed a circle, and around the edge were fragments of broken stone set upright in the sand. Quickly, into the center, said Evelyn, as the moon slowly rose above the horizon. Nothing happened at first. Then the sand seemed to shimmer. The circle began to spin, and the three figures huddled together in the center. The moon was blotted out. Skeletor, Evelyn, and Beast Man could see nothing, not even each other. They were caught in a whirlwind of spinning darkness. Then the spinning slowed down and the darkness grew less. There was only the moonlight. They looked around them and saw that they stood on a smooth stone floor. Above their heads a domed roof was supported by carved stone pillars. High above the horizon the moon shone brightly. There was a sound of running water nearby. Far off were lights as from a city. Skeletor said, I think that we are in exactly the same place as before, but two thousand years in the past. We will wait until daylight before we make a move. They rested uncomfortably on the stone floor, and at last day began to break. Beyond the stone pillars was a new world. There was no desert. The countryside stretched green and fertile all around. The rocky gully was a fast-flowing river. There was no sign of the hover car on the far bank. Holding their energy weapons at the ready, Skeletor and Evil Lynn left the stone building, and, followed by Beast Man with his stun whip, they made their way across a road towards where they had seen the lights. They saw the towers of a great city, and standing above everything was a castle. They were within a mile of the city walls when Beast Man grunted, Something comes, he said. In a few minutes, a troop of mounted warriors galloped up and surrounded the three strangers. The leader looked down at them. Who are you? he asked. Who dares to approach the castle of the warlord without permission? Stand aside, dog, snarled Skeletor. I, a Skeletor, lord of destruction, need permission of no man to go about my business. And what is your business? asked the soldier. That is between me and your master, cried Skeletor. Stand aside, and he aimed his energy weapon. But nothing happened. Evelyn drew hers, and again nothing happened. Take them prisoner, cried the troop leader. The troopers leapt from their horses. Skeletor and Evil Lynn struggled fiercely. Beast Man used the stun whip as an ordinary whip, and had laid low half of the soldiers before he, like the others, was overpowered and bound with chains. They were each chained to a horse and forced to trudge behind the troop. 
Skeletor, Evil Lynn, and Beast Man passed through a massive gateway in the city wall. Then they were led higher and higher through the city until they crossed a drawbridge and entered through another gate. They were prisoners in the castle of the Warlord of Eternia. In the great hall of the castle, the warlord sat surrounded by his knights and other warriors. Suddenly, the door at the end of the hall flew open, and a messenger came in. Your lordship, he said, three strangers were arrested an hour ago on the great road. They can give no sensible account of themselves. Describe them, said the warlord. One is a wild, hairy fellow, said the messenger, and something of a warrior. He fought skillfully with a whip-like weapon. The second is clearly a madman, and they are accompanied by a female, a slave, I presume. Keep them well guarded, said the warlord. I will examine them this evening. The prisoners were led deep into the rock below the castle. There they were put into separate cells. The footsteps of the guards died away. Skeletor waited. Then, summoning all his mental energy, he sent out a thought message to Beast Man and Evil Lynn. They quickly replied by the same means. When we meet the warlord, all will be put right, said Skeletor. Someone has made a terrible mistake. We are the ones who made the mistake, said Evil Lynn, coming here in the first place. We are helpless. Our weapons do not work because we are in a different time zone when energy weapons did not exist. Our only hope is to escape. We must reach the time corridor exit when the moon is in the right phase. That gives us a month, said Skeletor. Less a day, said Beast Man. Later, when night had fallen, the cell doors were thrown open. They were led up to the great hall and brought before the warlord of Eternia. As Skeletor caught sight of the warlord, he screamed out, This is a disgrace! I demand that you release us immediately. I am Skeletor, Lord of Destruction. You will rue this day, I tell you. What is he talking about? asked the warlord. I don't know, said the guard. He's been raving on like that ever since he was captured. The fellow's mad, exclaimed the warlord, and probably dangerous. Keep him locked up and chained until I decide what to do with him. Take the female to the servants' quarters. Then the warlord turned to Beast Man. Now, my fine fellow, he said, you are indeed a warrior after my own heart. It surprises me that you are served by such as the madman. Who are you? They call me Beast Man, was the reply. Well, Beast Man said the warlord. Whips are used by my wagon drivers and slave masters, but no one has ever seen a whip used as a weapon. I would like to see it for myself. He clapped his hands, and a slave came forward carrying a long-necked, two-handled wine jar. The company cleared a space in the center of the hall, and the girl was made to stand with the jar balanced on her head. Now, show me, said the warlord. A guard handed Beast Man his stun whip. He pressed the control, but the energy pack was still dead. He cracked the whip, and, taking a quick aim, he flicked the lash at the wine jar, sending one of the handles spinning to the floor. Almost in the same second, the other handle followed. With a loud crack, the whip curled round the neck and broke it off. Then, with an evil smile, Beast Man smashed the jar to pieces, scattering wine in all directions. The slave ran out of the hall, screaming. The company cheered and clapped. The warlord said, One more test. He signaled to a guard who ran forward and hurled a spear at Beast Man. But the spear had barely left the man's hand before the whip had snaked out and snatched it from the air. The warlord looked at Beast Man. Serve me as a warrior, he said. With you by my side, I shall be invincible. You will be numbered among the greatest in the land. You will have power and riches second only to myself. Beast Man stood, silent and confused. He was half animal, 
The human part of him wanted to say yes, but the animal part only knew Skeletor as master. Skeletor was in trouble, and it was up to Beast Man to help him. He slowly shook his shaggy head. The warlord looked angry for a moment. Very well, he said. You may change your mind, but I want you to train a regiment of my soldiers to fight with whips. You will live with them in the barracks. You will neither be chained nor return to your dungeon. If I do what you ask, said Beast Man, will you set Skeletor and Evil Lin free? <clears throat> Your servants, said the warlord, you are a thoughtful master. In less than a month we hold the great games. If you fight and defeat an opponent of my choosing, they will be set free to return to their own country. And I with them? Yes, said the warlord. By then I should have whip fighters enough. All three of you may leave then. Alone in his dungeon, Skeletor knew nothing of what was happening to Beast Man. Evil Lin went as a servant with the guard who took Skeletor his food. You are lucky. Your master has found favor with the warlord, said the guard. Our what? screamed Skeletor. He means Beast Man, said Evil Lin. Yes, the hairy one with the whip, said the guard. He lives in comfort and teaches his skills to the warlord's soldiers. He is to fight in the arena at the great games. If he wins, you will go free. <laughs> at least, that is what the warlord says, but uh, I wouldn't be so sure. Evil Lynn asked the guard when the games were to be held. When he had gone, she whispered to Skeletor, You know what this means? On the same day as the games, we must be at the time corridor at moonrise if we are to return to our own time. Beast Man was enjoying himself training the soldiers to use a whip. They held him in great awe and called him Sir. He began to think that perhaps he should enter the service of the warlord and forget about Skeletor and Evil Lynn. The day of the games arrived, and the warlord sent for Beast Man. As my champion, and as a special treat for my people, you will be the last to fight in the arena. I have reserved a worthy opponent for you. See to it that you give us good sport. And when I win? asked Beast Man. All is arranged, said the warlord. A chariot and horses will be ready to take you and your servants back to your home immediately after the games. And, to show my generosity, your people shall watch you fight for their freedom. All morning, crowds had been pouring down the hill and out of the city gates to the great arena. At midday, a fanfare announced the approach of the warlord. He came leading a long procession of mounted knights and other warriors. Riding at his right hand was Beast Man. The warlord took his seat. The guards led Evelyn and Skeletor, now without his chains, to the other side of the arena. There was another fanfare of trumpets, and the games began. There were wrestlers and boxers, horse races, chariot races, and warriors who fought with swords and spears. The sun was low in the sky when the trumpet sounded again, and the crowd fell quiet. A gate at one end was thrown open, and Beast Man, his whip in his hand, strode to the center of the arena. The crowd cheered, then waited silently. Slowly, a huge pair of iron doors swung open at the other end of the arena. Something moved in the shadows. Then, into the crimson light of the setting sun, came a giant manticore. The crowd gasped. Even Beast Man took a step back. The creature turned its almost human face to look at Beast Man. The muscles of its lion-like body rippled as it stretched its dragon's wings and swung its scorpion tail from side to side. Then, without warning, it charged.
beast man threw himself to one side, just avoiding the stinging tail as the manticore charged past. He then leapt to his feet and aimed the long whip, but as it cracked out, the manticore soared into the air with its wings outspread. It circled just out of range, while beast man turned with it, waiting for the next attack. The creature made a sudden swoop. This time, beast man was ready. The whip cracked, and its lash bit through the manticore's thick fur. Enraged, it hovered over beast man's head, ready to strike. Beast man tried to reach it with the whip, but the manticore kept its distance, just out of range. Beast man suddenly turned and ran. The manticore followed, and the crowd booed. Beast man ignored the boos. He ran as hard as he could for the side of the arena. There he stopped, his back against the wall. The manticore, with a scream of triumph, swooped down on its victim and swerved away at the last moment. The manticore could not attack beast man from the air without striking the wall. It soared round and dropped to the ground. Then, cautiously, it began to creep forward. Beast Man watched as it came closer. He flicked out the whip and cracked it in the air. The manticore glanced up but did not stop. Slowly, the gap narrowed. The whip was now snapping the air above the beast's head. It was confused. What was its enemy up to? Beast Man sent the long whip whistling out, not over the manticore's head, but into the sand in front of it. The sand flew up in the creature's face. Holding the whip by the tip of the lash, Beast Man swung the heavy handle around his head. The lash wrapped itself tightly around the manticore's legs, then its wings and tail, until it lay helpless in the sand of the arena. The crowd cheered. Beast Man turned to where the warlord sat. I have kept my part of the bargain, he cried. Will you now keep yours? The warlord made a sign, and Beast Man was escorted out of the arena. A chariot stood waiting, and Skeletor and Evelyn were already there. Beast Man jumped aboard, and Evelyn took the reins. We must hurry, said Skeletor. It is not long to moonrise. And I do not trust the warlord, said Evelyn. It's all too easy. In the gathering dusk, they clattered along the road. Then they saw the domed building with the carved pillars. The moon had not yet risen. We've made it, cried Skeletor. Not yet, cried Beast Man. Listen. Behind on the road, they heard hoofbeats. Beast Man jumped from the moving chariot. You go on, he cried. I'll delay them. The riders rode up swiftly. The warlord has changed his mind, cried the leader. He was one of those taught to use a whip by Beast Man. The man lashed out with his whip. Beast Man, faster than the eye could see, threw up his arm and let the lash curl round it. Then with a jerk he pulled the man from the saddle. I didn't teach you everything, he shouted. In a moment, the other soldiers were in full retreat. The moon was barely below the horizon. Hurry, shouted Evelyn as she and Skeletor stood under the dome. Beast Man reached the building and stopped, suddenly thoughtful. If he stayed, he might still be somebody in the service of the warlord of Eternia. Then Skeletor grasped him by the arm and pulled him into the center of the circle of columns. As they stood, the moon slowly rose in the eastern sky. The sky and the moonlit landscape seemed to spin and fade, and Skeletor, Evelyn, and Beast Man huddled together on a circle of crumbling paving stones in the middle of the desert. We are back, said Evelyn. There was no highway, no city lights, no grass. The river was a dry gully. On the far side of the gully, the hover car stood waiting. They made their way back to it. You've forgotten something, said Evil Lynn to Skeletor. What's that, witch? 
You were going to recruit an army of warriors. Remember? Skeletor screamed with rage. As the hover car started on its journey back to Snake Mountain, Beastman looked back. I think I'll go back there someday, he said. If you go anywhere, it will be to the sulfur mines, shouted Skeletor. Beastman said nothing more. He just thought, If I do go back, it will be to return with an army. Then Eternia will have a new Lord of Destruction. The hover car sped across the planet while Skeletor brooded on what his next move should be in his war against the powers of good. Fugitives. He-Man sat in the control room of Castle Grayskull. In their endless fight against the forces of evil, the masters of the universe used all kinds of equipment. With the help of a radio telescope, they could look far across the galaxy. Any invader could be seen long before he came close to the planet Eternia. He-Man sat at the monitor screen, but there was nothing to see. The occasional meteor flashed across, but that was all. He was about to rise from his seat when something caught his attention. A faint blip of light had appeared on the edge of the screen. He-Man increased the magnification, and the light became a large disk in the center of the screen. The computer showed that it was still far out in space, but it was approaching Eternia at superstellar velocity. He-Man called the others. Channeled through the audio system, the signal from the radio telescope made a crackling hiss of faint radio signals. As the hours went by and the object drew nearer, the radio signals began to sound like a distant voice. Someone out there was trying to communicate. He-Man switched the audio signal through a language synthesizer, which converted the alien tongue into Eternian. In a few moments, the masters of the universe heard a strange voice. We seek sanctuary. We are survivors from the planet of Elysia. Invaders from deep space have turned our home into a wasteland. All we ask is a corner of Eternia where we may settle and build a new home. He-Man replied, You are welcome to come to Eternia. We will give you coordinates which will enable you to make a landing. Meanwhile, in Snake Mountain, Skeletor had also picked up the alien transmissions. He stood on the mountain and peered into the night sky. Somewhere out there were space voyagers who thought that they would find a refuge on Eternia. Little do they know, he said. The Lord of Destruction will greet them as a welcome addition to his army of slaves. Day after day, the Elysian craft came closer and the signals grew stronger. Soon the viewing screen was switched from the radio telescope to the optical telescope. The masters of the universe now had a clear picture of the spaceship. It was completely round and appeared against the stars and the blackness of the sky as a shiny silver ball. Another day went by and they could make out the windows, running in a single line right round the hull. One afternoon, Tila was on duty in the control room when the voice of an Elysian came over the audio system. If you switch your monitors to Teleview, we are now close enough to transmit live pictures. Tila touched the controls. For a moment, the screen became fuzzy. Then the image came into focus. She was looking at two figures sitting at the control deck of the Elysian spaceship. They wore what looked like protective spacesuits, but their heads were uncovered. She called the others. When they were assembled, He-Man said, These are my comrades in arms. We are known as the masters of the universe. 
This is our power base, Castle Grayskull. The data we have given you should enable you to land close by. Thank you, said one of the Elysians. I am Creon, last of the twelve elders of Elysia. There are almost a thousand of my people here. It has been a long and tiring journey through the cosmos. Soon we will be free to walk the land and breathe the air of fair Eternia. From our calculations, said He-Man, we should have visual contact from the ground in just over ten hours. Orko had drifted into the control room. As He-Man switched off the video screen, he said, I've been to Elysia. Long before I came to Eternia, I had many Elysian friends. What can you tell us about Elysia? asked Tila. It is, or, or was, very beautiful. I liked it because it made me feel like a giant. The people of Elysia are small, are they? asked He-Man. Oh, yes, said Orko. But you will see that when they arrive tomorrow. It was still dark the following morning when the masters of the universe assembled on the battlements of Castle Grayskull. All eyes were turned to the sky. Then, low on the eastern horizon appeared a bright light, brighter than the stars and moving across the sky. Here they come, cried Orko. The Elysian spaceship streaked across the sky. It passed almost overhead and a moment later had disappeared over the horizon. They didn't stop, cried Orko. They're still a long way out in space, said He-Man. They have to make several orbits of Eternia until their speed is low enough for a safe landing. In the next hour, they saw the orbiting ship twice. Then the sun rose, and it was lost against the brightness of the morning sky. On his own monitoring system, deep within Snake Mountain, Skeletor had also observed the approach of the Elysians. His plan to capture them and make them slaves was not going well. To begin with, he had not bargained on there being so many. The people of Elysia were peaceful, but a thousand of them was more than even the Lord of Destruction could expect to handle. And a landing near the walls of Castle Grayskull would not make it any easier. Eventually, he decided. I will let the poor fools land in peace, he said to himself. Let those interfering busybodies in Castle Grayskull do all the work finding them a place to live then when they least expect it, and He-Man and his cronies are out of the way, I shall strike. However, Skeletor still wanted to see for himself what the Elysians were like, but the sinister evergreen forest made it impossible for him to reach the castle on foot. He decided to travel in one of his fighting machines, so that he could fly to the far side of the forest in safety and spy on the landing from among the trees. Which should he use? He decided upon the Rotan. Its hover propulsion enabled it to travel over any kind of country, and its cruel, whirling blades were ideal for cutting away through the forest undergrowth. While the masters of the universe were watching the Elysian spacecraft in orbit, Skeletor's slaves prepared their master's Rotan, and he set off for Castle Grayskull. The forest muffled the sound of the Rotan's approach, and Skeletor brought it to a halt just inside the trees. He looked in the direction of the castle. Between the trunks of the trees he had a clear view across open land to the castle. The Elysians were expected to touch down close by. In the control room, He-Man called up the Elysian leader. Immediately he appeared on the screen. We have completed our final orbit he reported. We are on course and are going to landing stations now, Creon continued. All transmissions will now cease until after touchdown. We are on full alert for your landing, said He-Man. Good luck. Thank you, said the Elysian. Closing down transmission now. The screen went blank. Man-at-arms stayed by the monitor. The others hurried up onto the ramparts. The seconds ticked by. Any moment they expected to hear the roar of retro rockets and to see the spaceship descending. But the sky remained empty. A flock of birds was circling and screeching above the forest. But that was the only sound. Something has disturbed them, said Tila. 
But it isn't a spacecraft. Over the castle internal communication system, they heard man-at-arms voice as he counted down to landing. Five, four, three, two, one. Touchdown! But nothing happened. Tila said, I thought I saw something just now, just a quick movement against the dark of the forest. A bird, I should think, said He-Man. Man-at-arms came, hurrying up from the control room. He stopped, amazed. Where is it? he asked. He-Man shrugged. They must have come down somewhere, he said. Let's see if we can raise them by radio. Man-at-arms switched on the monitor. Immediately there appeared the face of Creon, the Elysian leader. He did not look pleased. What has happened? he shouted. Why has no one come to greet us? We can't see you, said He-Man. You must have come down in the wrong place. We landed on the coordinates you gave us, said Creon. We've been down for five minutes now, and we can't even see the castle you mentioned. Perhaps you have a system malfunction, suggested Man-at-Arms. Elysian systems do not malfunction, shouted Creon, crimson with rage. I should have warned you, said Orko. Elysians take offense very easily. We will come to look for you, said He-Man. Perhaps our calculations were at fault. Keep your receiving equipment open for further messages. Leaving man at arms manning the control room, He-Man and Tila took off in Wind Raiders to look for the missing spaceship. They roared into the sky and flew in ever-widening circles. But there was nothing. At last, they returned to Castle Grayskull. Again, they contacted the Elysians. We are completely baffled, said He-Man. Can you describe the place where you have landed? We are in some sort of forest, said Creon. The trees are like nothing we have on Elysia. Here the trunks are green and are very tall, taller than our spaceship. He-Man looked at the others. Where on Eternia are there tall trees with green trunks? There are bamboo forests on the Golden Isles, said Tila. Creon could be describing bamboo trees. Yes, but they don't grow taller than a spaceship, said Man-at-Arms. He-Man went back to the monitor. Could you, he said, make some kind of signal? Some of your people could go outside and light a fire. We could find you by following the smoke. My people are afraid to leave the ship, said Creon. Because of the enormous monsters. They are as big as our ship. They have huge teeth and are tearing down and devouring the trees. He-Man sat frowning at the screen for a moment. Then he jumped up. I think I know what the problem is, he cried. Where's Orko? He-Man rushed to the ramparts, followed by the others. Orko had been having a nap and had missed all the excitement so far. He floated up, rubbing his eyes. Orko! Tell us about the Elysians, said He-Man. You said that they were small. How small? Orko held up his hand with his forefinger and thumb almost touching. That small, he said. Not much bigger than ants. Elysia is a very small planet. That's it, cried He-Man. When we saw them on the screen, we assumed that they were the same size as ourselves. When Orko said they made him feel like a giant, we thought that they must be just a little smaller than him. So, they have landed, said Tila. The movement I saw against the tree must have been them. And they've been out there all the time where they were supposed to be, said Man-at-Arms. Their spaceship must be no bigger than a football, and it's lying out there in the long grass. And there are the monsters, said Tila. She pointed to a couple of rabbits that were quietly feeding. Just beyond them was a glint of something metal lying in the long grass. He-Man dashed down to the courtyard and ran over the jawbridge towards the small shiny thing that he could see quite clearly now. Skeletor was startled by this sudden activity over by the castle. The Rotan had no monitor equipment, so he had no idea what had happened. He thought that they must have spotted him when the Wind Raiders took off on their search mission. He was even more puzzled when they returned. Then He-Man came running out of the gate. 
Skeletor quickly focused his electron binoculars. There was something lying in the grass. It was something valuable by the way He-Man was hurrying. Something worth having, whatever it was. Skeletor started the Rotan and roared out of the forest. He spotted the metal sphere and came down beside it. In a moment, he had leapt out, gathered it up, and was back at the controls and away. He-Man fired at Skeletor, but the Rotan had already reached the cover of the forest. He-Man turned and called for Battle Cat. The great cat came bounding over the jawbridge towards He-Man. He-Man leapt into the saddle and set off in pursuit of the Rotan. The path cut through the undergrowth by the Rotan was easy to follow, and steadily the powerful animal began to gain on the machine. Skeletor looked back. He-Man was getting close. Skeletor pressed a control and set the savage blaze of the Rotan whirling. Then he changed course, heading directly into the trees. The blades sliced through the trunks, which fell in a tangled mass behind him. Battle Cat reached the first of the fallen trees and started scrambling over, but already Skeletor was drawing ahead. On Castle Grayskull, the watchers saw He-Man galloping in pursuit of Skeletor and the Elysian spacecraft. In the forest, He-Man urged Battle Cat on, but the tangle of trunks and branches were difficult for even the mighty muscles of the fighting cat. Suddenly, He-Man heard a new sound behind him. Turning, he saw Teela speeding towards him at the controls of the Road Ripper. She pulled up and leapt out. He-Man took her place. I have a plan, but I must get back to the castle, she cried. Then she leapt up onto Battle Cat and raced back towards Castle Grayskull. Now, He-Man was again on the trail of Skeletor. Straight as an arrow, the Road Ripper smashed through the tangle of fallen trees. Skeletor looked over his shoulder as He-Man came into view. He spun the Rotan round to fire the laser cannons at He-Man, but the shots went wide. Teela and Battle Cat reached the castle and swept over the jawbridge. Teela sprinted for the control room, calling to man-at-arms. Quick, she panted. See if the Elysians are still able to receive our signals. Man-at-arms adjusted the controls and Creon appeared on the screen. What's happening? he cried. Is it an earthquake? You and your people have been kidnapped, spaceship and all, said man-at-arms. Rescue is at hand, but we need your help. Is your craft armed? Yes, said Creon. We have defensive ion blasters built into the hull. Right, said man-at-arms. Open fire immediately. There is no need to aim. Give the order now. They saw Creon turn and heard his voice. Activate ion blasters. Stand by to fire all batteries on random fire. Fire! He-Man was close to Skeletor when he saw the Rotan go wildly out of control. It spun round and swerved from side to side as Skeletor shrieked and waved his arms about, as if he were being attacked by a thousand wasps. The mini-blasts from the Elysian weapons stung like red-hot pinpricks. One final wild lurch of the Rotan, and the small spaceship was hurled out to land in a bed of dead leaves. Without looking back, Skeletor took off at top speed for the safety of Snake Mountain, not sure what had gone wrong with his plans. He-Man halted the Road Ripper and very carefully went up to the Elysian craft. Back in Castle Grayskull, Teela told Creon that he and his people were safe and to hold their fire. Then, with the shiny sphere safely aboard, He-Man returned to the castle. Later that day, the Elysians and their spaceship were packed into a wind raider. Escorted by the masters of the universe, they were transported to a small but fertile valley in a distant part of Eternia. There they founded a colony and lived in peace and contentment, unknown to anyone else on the planet but the masters of the universe. Dragon from the Lost Valley.
In a remote country district of Eternia, night had fallen. A few lights still shone in the windows of cottages and farmhouses. Many of the peasants were already in bed and asleep. Suddenly, there was a loud rumbling noise. It filled the air. Then the ground began to shake. An earthquake! The ground moved like the waves of the sea. Walls fell down, roofs collapsed, and the terrified people ran from their homes. The shock was felt far away in the royal palace. The guards scattered as pieces of stone fell from the walls, and King Randor quickly sent for the members of his council to find out what was happening. The chief scientist told the king that he had detected an earth tremor many miles from the palace. It had been strong enough to cause much damage to anything near at hand. Contact all village chiefs and other leaders in the earthquake area immediately, ordered the king. I want reports without delay of damage and injuries. Start preparing food, clothing, and medical supplies. Organize rescue parties to be sent wherever they may be needed. Then King Randor sent for Prince Adam. You are in charge of this whole operation, he said. Someday you will be king. Now is the time to learn to care for your people. Adam went to work, organizing the earthquake relief work. By the end of the week, reports had come in, and he had sent out teams to help the people and repair the damage. A meeting of the council was held to make a final report to the king. But as the meeting was taking place, a palace servant entered with a message. Another report of earthquake damage, said King Randor. Not exactly, said Adam, reading the note. It's from a village chief. His village was not badly damaged by the earthquake. Now it has been completely destroyed by a dragon. The counselors laughed. Dragon indeed, they said. The shock of the earthquake must have been too much for him. But by the time the council meeting was over, several other similar reports of a dragon had been received. Next morning, a party of horsemen asked to see King Randor. They were farmers and had ridden all night. A huge dragon had demolished a nearby village, destroyed a forest, and laid waste the entire harvest. The king invited the farmers to tell their story to the council. The dragon is dangerous. We must kill it, said the counselors. Wait, cried Adam. Why kill it? We know nothing about it. Father, I would like some time to think before we make up our minds. The king agreed. We will meet again in an hour, he said. In his private room, the prince looked again at the reports. Then he asked the farmers, Has the dragon attacked anyone? No, said one man. But it turned nasty when we tried to drive it away with scythes and pitchforks and sticks. I think anyone would turn nasty if a crowd came at them with scythes, pitchforks, and sticks, said Adam. Why did it destroy the village? I don't suppose that it meant to, said another farmer. It tried to walk down the village street, but it was too narrow for it. The houses just got pushed over. And the corn and the forest? Oh, it ate those, the men said, all except the tree trunks. Adam thanked the farmers and went back to the king and the council. The dragon is not a dangerous man-eating monster, he said. It is a very large but very frightened animal which lives on plants. I believe that it was disturbed by the earthquake and is now lost and afraid. Rather than kill it, I think that we should find out where it has come from. Then perhaps we can help it to return to its lair. Uh, very well, said the king. I leave it in your hands, my son. Man-at-arms, you will accompany the prince and give him all the help you can. I give you a week. If by then you have failed in your plan, then the dragon will have to be killed. As soon as they were alone, Adam said to Man-at-arms, This is a task for the masters of the universe. Calling for his giant Eternian cat, Cringer, Prince Adam strolled out of the palace and into the nearby woods. Once out of sight, he drew the sword of power and cried, By the power of Greyskull! And instantly he became He-Man, while Cringer was transformed into Battle Cat.
Leaping into the saddle, He-Man urged Battle Cat to his top speed in the direction of Castle Greyskull. At the castle, He-Man first went to the control room. He studied the printout from the seismograph on which the earthquake was recorded. He fed the information to the computer and, at the touch of a button, a bright spot of light appeared on a wall map of Eternia. This was the exact location of the strongest earthquake shock, an almost unknown region in the Mystic Mountains. He-Man summoned Stratos, Man-at-Arms, and Tila to join him at Castle Grayskull and lost no time in explaining the situation. We all know, he said, that the Mystic Mountains hide many creatures now extinct on the rest of Eternia. I am sure that the dragon is one of those. The earthquake may have made a gap in the mountains, allowing the creature to escape. From the descriptions, it could be a stegosaurus. They were gentle beasts, said Tila, and plant eaters. They were also very stupid, said He-Man, which may not make our task any easier. Riding a Wind Raider each, He-Man, Tila, and Man-at-Arms set off for the village where the dragon was last reported. Stratos flew under his own power. Even before they reached the spot, they saw the trail left by the dragon. The woods were leafless stumps. The cornfields showed only patches of stubble. Then they saw the dragon. As I guessed, said He-Man, a stegosaurus. And it's enormous! At the sound of the jets, the huge creature swung its head in their direction. It twitched its spiked tail, and a wooden barn was smashed to bits. The stegosaurus was some distance from the village. He-Man signaled to the others, and the flight of wind raiders went in to land on the village green. The villagers came out from the cover of their houses and crowded round. Then they made way for their village chief. While Stratos circled overhead, keeping an eye on things, the masters of the universe listened as the village chief explained what had happened. The monster is becoming angry, he said. It may be hungry, but it has already eaten everything. What can you do? Speak to it, said Tila. Holding her cobra scepter high above her head, she sent thought signals to the stegosaurus. Nothing happened. Again and again she tried, until, in her mind, she began to hear the jumbled thoughts of the stegosaurus. The village people were crowding round to watch. The stegosaurus backed away, and Tila caught its message. Frightened! She waved the crowd back, and again the creature's mind sent out a simple message. Food! It is frightened and hungry, said Tila. At least we can try to feed it, said He-Man. He gave orders to the village chief to collect as many cartloads of hay as could be found. When the carts arrived, He-Man and Man-at-Arms drove them as close as they dared to the Stegosaurus and piled the hay on the ground. Then everyone withdrew to the village and watched as the giant creature ate. Tila sensed sleepy from its thoughts. In a moment... It settled its vast bulk on the ground and fell asleep. Stratos set off to follow the Stegosaurus's trail and find out where it had come from. Man-at-Arms headed back to Castle Grayskull to prepare some special dragon-catching equipment. He-Man and Tila stayed with the villagers to keep watch. They didn't know that they were not the only ones keeping an eye on the situation. Far off in his lair in Snake Mountain, Skeletor had been watching on his video spy scan. He had seen the damage done by the Stegosaurus. His eyes glowed with pleasure as he saw its powerful spiked tail and muscular body. Ah, oh, what a beauty, Skeletor muttered to himself. Don't you think so, Panthor? The evil black Eternian cat growled. Ha, 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 you're jealous, said the Lord of Destruction. And no wonder, with a monster of such magnificence to do my bidding, few would stand in my way. Panthor slunk away into the shadows as Skeletor shouted to his slaves, Prepare the Rotan for immediate departure. Meanwhile, Stratos soared through the sky. Ahead lay the Mystic Mountains. Great cracks appeared where the earthquake had torn the ground apart. 
Huge rocks lay split and shattered. Everyone on Eternia had heard of the mysterious Lost Valley. The walls were said to be so steep that no creature could climb them. It was here that animals from the past still lived. There, directly below, Stratos saw a wide valley. He swooped down to take a closer look. The bottom was hidden in shadow, but at one end of the valley the mountainside was split from top to bottom. The gap was easily wide enough for even the Stegosaurus to have passed through. Back at the village, man-at-arms had returned from Castle Grayskull. He held a small object in his hand as he joined He-Man and Tila. This, he said, is a neurotransducer. All we have to do is attach it to the Stegosaurus's head with these suction cups, and its thought waves will be amplified. It will help Tila to speak to it. E-Man took the device and walked towards the sleeping Stegosaurus. Its head was on the ground, its neck stretched out. He-Man crept carefully forward. The top of its head was level with He-Man's shoulder. He paused, took a deep breath, and swung his leg over the Stegosaurus's neck. And at that moment, it woke. With a scream of rage, the giant animal heaved itself to its feet. It lashed its tail and twisted its neck from side to side as it tried to dislodge He-Man. He-Man clung to the creature's neck with his legs and one hand. He tried to get the device in place, but each time the angry Stegosaurus nearly shook it from his grasp. Suddenly it reared up, tossing its head, and He-Man was sent flying. He landed with a thump close to Tila. The Nero transducer is in place, she cried. I'm picking up thought waves. It's certainly mad at you. Try and calm it down, said He-Man. Tila spoke gently to the raging Stegosaurus. She explained that they meant it no harm. They were only trying to help. And, little by little, its rage died away. Soon it stood as quiet as a kitten. At that moment, Stratos came swooping down to join the others. The Stegosaurus does indeed come from the Lost Valley, he said. I found the gap in the mountains through which it escaped, but the way is blocked. On its way here, the Stegosaurus must have crossed a wide river which flows from the Mystic Mountains. But the earthquake has altered the bed of the river. It is now in a deep gorge. There is a rock arch across the gorge which might just serve as a bridge, but it will mean a detour. What about food? said He-Man. The Stegosaurus requires a lot of feeding. We must plan the journey so that it always has enough green stuff to eat. Stratos told them that it should be possible to reach the Mystic Mountains without ever leaving the forest. The Stegosaurus would always have enough to eat. Tila now stood in front of the giant creature. She held aloft the cobra scepter, which glowed brightly as she sent her thoughts pulsing towards the giant brain. We mean you no harm. We are your friends. We will lead you back to your valley and your own kind. And from the Nero transducer, Tila heard, Friends, go home now. While the huge head nodded slowly to show that it understood. While Stratos flew on ahead, Tila went in front to guide the Stegosaurus. He, man and man at arms, hovered in their wind raiders on either side of it. Tila held up her scepter and said, Follow me and the Stegosaurus lumbered forward on its journey home. The villagers ran cheering after the monster, waving and laughing at the thought of being rid of it. The Stegosaurus half turned its head to look back. Tila heard, Friends! from its simple mind. From the sky, Stratos kept watch over his friends and their giant charge. All seemed peaceful. Then... His sharp eyes caught a movement in the far distance. Something was moving swiftly just above treetop level. It was approaching fast. Stratos flew as close as he could to the strange craft. As soon as it was within earshot, he knew what it was. The Rotan, Skeletor's devilish hover vehicle with its whirling knife blades. And it was the Lord of Destruction himself who sat at the controls. Suddenly, Skeletor put his machine into a tight turn and headed back the way he had come. 
Whatever his evil plan, he was in no hurry to put it into operation. The Stegosaurus moved slowly, munching its way steadily through the forest. Tila tried to explain that it really must hurry, but it just didn't understand and plodded on day after day. At last, the peaks of the mystic mountains came in sight. Stratos reported that the rock arch was only a short distance away. He-Man and Man-at-Arms went on ahead. The arch looked very slender and fragile. Let's take a closer look, said He-Man. They dismounted from their wind raiders and walked to the arch. The gorge was deep and the river roared in fierce rapids far below. He-Man took a few steps onto the arch. Look out, cried Man-at-Arms. Under He-Man's weight, small pieces of rock were crumbling from the arch. He-Man rejoined Man-at-Arms. That was only loose stones, he said. But there are some big cracks. It can't stand much longer. If we delay, we may be too late. Tila joined them, and the masters of the universe talked together. But they were not aware of a pair of evil eyes watching from a distance. The Stegosaurus, however, left to browse quietly by itself, was aware of something. It stopped eating and raised its head as the neurotransducer picked up some very unpleasant thought waves. Hidden by the forest, Skeletor hovered in the rotan, preparing to strike. One stunning blast for my laser cannons will keep the monster quiet while I deal with those puny creatures who seek to keep it from me, screamed Skeletor. The rotan rose swiftly. Skeletor banked it round and came skimming across the treetops, firing the twin laser cannons as he came. His evil thoughts were picked up by the neurotransducer. The Stegosaurus was normally a gentle beast, but the effect of so much wickedness pouring into its mind was too much. It gave a roar of rage and swung round to meet its attacker. Caught by surprise, Skeletor missed his aim. He skimmed around in a wide circle to make another attack. Again, Skeletor fired, and again the Stegosaurus avoided the shots. Skeletor now decided to attack under cover of the forest. He dropped below the level of the treetops. Then, setting the blades of the rotan whirling, he headed straight for the Stegosaurus. The animal heard the noise, but couldn't see its enemy. The rotan came screaming across the top of the forest, its deadly blades slashing at the foliage, leaving behind a trail of stripped branches. The stegosaurus roared with anger. Skeletor was destroying its food supply. It attacked the rotan in the only way it knew. Wheeling round, it swung its mighty spiked tail. Skeletor tried to swerve his craft out of the way. The tail missed the rotan, but its tip struck the Lord of Destruction. Skeletor was swept up and out of the rotan. He flew through the air and crashed with a jarring thud high in the branches of a tall tree. The pilotless rotan spun across the trees and into the gorge. The masters of the universe watched it crash into the rapids. They ran to the Stegosaurus. It was unhurt. From its mind came, Wicked! Kill! Tila called up into the tree. Skeletor, I think that you'd better stay where you are for the time being. I don't think that our pet likes you. Tila spoke to the Stegosaurus. It followed her to the edge of the gorge, but it would not set foot on the arch. We shall have to lead it across, she said. But with what? With this, replied Man-at-Arms. I thought we might need it at some point. It's an energy noose. He held the device out as if he were aiming a weapon. Then a pulsing ray of light shot out. At a touch on the controls, the ray looped round to form a noose. Man-at-arms flipped it around Tila's shoulders, and it held her firmly but gently. He pressed a switch, and the ray vanished, and Tila was free. He handed the device to Tila. Lasso, your large friend, he said, and lead him across. Tila spoke soothingly to the Stegosaurus. Then she sent a noose of pure energy to encircle its great neck. She backed away towards the arch, and after a moment's hesitation, the creature followed. Slowly, 
One great step at a time, it moved towards the center of the arch. He-Man and Man-at-Arms flew on either side in their wind raiders while Stratos flew overhead. Suddenly, Stratos shouted, The arch! It's cracking! Hurry, Tila! Pieces began to break away, and at each step of the Stegosaurus, the whole arch swayed from side to side. At this point, the Stegosaurus decided to rest for a moment. Tila tugged at the energy noose and sent out urgent thought waves. Slowly, the giant creature started moving again. Now it was over the center of the arch. Tila reached solid ground and urged the Stegosaurus to take the last few steps. Behind it, the rock arch collapsed into the gorge. Stratos flew back to recover Tila's wind raider. With the energy noose removed from its neck, the Stegosaurus started on its way again. It raised its head and sniffed the breeze. Then it began to move faster. It senses that it is almost home, said Tila. Home, came the thought from the Nero transducer. The masters of the universe simply followed now as a Stegosaurus made its own way through the foothills of the Mystic Mountains. The rocks rose steeply on every side. Soon a great wall of snow-clad mountain lay across the route. The Stegosaurus stopped. I think that it has forgotten where the gap in the mountain is, said He-Man. Stratos, you guide us from the air. Tila, speak to it. Tell it to follow you. Stratos took off. After a few minutes, he swooped low and called, This way! Tila held her cobra scepter high above her head. It glowed with her thought energy. Follow this, she said. We're almost there. Then man-at-arms shouted, I see it! Sunlight streamed through a high gap in the mountain. Tila led the huge creature to the gap and into the valley. She stopped, and they watched it lumber slowly on by itself. Stratos suddenly leapt into the air, and he deftly removed the Nero transducer from the giant head. Even without it, Tila caught a faint thought from the Stegosaurus. Thank you! Goodbye! Then it was gone into the mists and shadows of the Lost Valley. He was really rather nice, said Tila. It's a pity we couldn't keep him. I think he would have found Castle Grayskull a bit cramped, said He-Man. And it wouldn't have been long before he had eaten the whole of the evergreen forest, said Man-at-Arms. The masters of the universe had one more task. They aimed their energy weapons at the rock face above the gap. With a roar, a great landslide plunged into the valley, sealing the gap once more. Stratos set off for his home in the land of Avion. The others lifted off in their wind raiders bound for Castle Grayskull. As they recrossed the gorge and the forest, they saw Skeletor still stuck in the top of the tree. He-Man called down to him, Be patient, Skeletor! I'm sure that at this very moment your devoted slaves are hurrying to your rescue. Let this be a lesson to you. Remember that not all large, ugly creatures are evil and dangerous like yourself. of Crystal Mountain. On Queen Marlena's birthday, her people brought her presents. They came from every corner of Eternia and brought gifts of every kind. The dwarfs of the Ice Mountains came with precious stones and metals from their mines, and the gentle people of the Golden Isles brought delicate carvings of coral. Queen Marlena looked at the gifts piled high in the throne room of the palace. How happy I am, she said, to have such loyal and loving subjects. If I had any more presents, we should have no place to put them. At that moment a servant entered. 
Here is one more, Your Majesty, he said. It was handed to the guards at the gate by a traveling hunter. He said that a shepherd asked him to deliver it to you. It looks as if it has traveled through many hands to get here. The queen took the package. It was small, wrapped in what looked like worn fur, and tied with a leather thong. King Randor cut the thong with his dagger. Inside the wrapping was a box carved from pale gray stone. In the box lay an intricately worked silver pendant on a bed of white fur. How lovely, exclaimed the queen, hanging it round her neck. Who is it from? But nowhere on the box, on the wrapping, or on the pendant itself, was there anything to say who had sent the gift or where it had come from. The last visitor had gone, and the royal family sat down to supper. The queen had barely taken her seat when she gave a cry and fell back unconscious in her chair. The king sent for the royal doctor, who took a blood sample from the queen and hurried away to examine it. Then he prepared his report and took it to King Randor. Your Majesty, he said, the queen is the victim of a virus so rare that no one living can remember when it last struck. The virus has only ever been found in the far north, in the country of the snow dwarfs. And don't the snow dwarfs suffer from the virus? asked the king. Uh, no, sire, said the doctor. The virus only comes to life in warmer climates, and the snow dwarfs never leave their cold polar lands. Prince Adam had been standing by the king, listening to the doctor's report. Suddenly he spoke. The pendant! Nobody knows where it came from, but the gray stone box. I have seen that sort of thing before. The snow dwarfs carve figures of seals and walruses from it. The pendant must be infected. It's a plot, cried the doctor. No, said the king. I know the snow dwarfs. They are good, loyal subjects and kindly people. I suppose it could be a plot hatched by some other evil mind, but I think that it was an accident. The dwarfs sent a gift to the queen, not knowing that the pendant was infected. Is there a cure? asked Adam. No, said the doctor. All that I can do for the moment is to keep watch on the patient and try the drugs we have. Adam did not wait to hear any more. He hurried from the palace, Cringer at his side. Then, once safely out of sight, he drew his sword with a cry of, by the power of Grayskull, he became He-Man, mightiest man in the universe, while the cowardly Cringer was transformed into the fearsome Battle Cat. In a moment, He-Man was in the saddle and speeding towards Castle Grayskull to talk with Zor, the sorceress. In the great hall of Castle Grayskull, He-Man stood before the sorceress. From what you say, she said, the queen has indeed been infected by the deadly virus. Unless she is given the antidote without delay, her blood will turn into ice crystals, and she will slowly freeze to death. It is the curse of Crystal Mountain. But where can I find the antidote? cried He-Man. Only the wise men of the Snow Dwarfs have that, said the sorceress. You must go to them in their chamber in Crystal Mountain. Its location is a secret. There was once a map carved on a walrus tusk, but that has long been lost. Take this. It will guide you just as well as any map. Zoar handed to He-Man a piece of rock crystal the length of a finger. The crystal was many-sided and glowed with ever-changing colors. It had a gold thread tied round the middle. This is a lodestone, said the sorceress. It has a powerful natural magnetic field. Hold it by the thread. He-Man did so. The lodestone swung and twirled for a moment. Then it stopped. He-Man saw that there was a strange symbol carved on one end. No matter where you are, the lodestone will always point the way to Crystal Mountain and the secret chamber of the snow dwarfs. You have no time to lose. You must leave immediately. He-Man turned to summon Battle Cat, but the sorceress stopped him. This is no journey even for a super beast, said the sorceress. You will need the power of a machine and the intelligence of a living creature. Stridor, 
exclaimed He-Man. Exactly, said the sorceress. Now I have done all I can. The rest is up to you. Leaving a reluctant battle cat in Castle Greyskull, He-Man clattered across the jaw bridge, mounted on the bionic horse Stridor. After fording the River of Doom, they entered the evergreen forest and took one of the secret paths known only to the masters of the universe. Then they left the forest behind and climbed into the hills. On a rocky ridge, He-Man halted Stridor. He held the lodestone by the thread for a moment. It pointed to a pass through the high mountains. Night had fallen by the time He-Man reached the top of the pass. A spring of clear water flowed from the rocks. He-Man took a refreshing drink and ate some of his emergency rations. Then he was on his way again. All through the night, Stridor's mechanical muscles kept him going mile after mile. As the sun rose, He-Man and his mount were clear of the mountains. They galloped in a cloud of dust across a wide plain. Although he had traveled by night, He-Man's departure from Castle Greyskull had not gone unnoticed by Skeletor. News of the Queen's sickness had spread through Eternia. Skeletor had rejoiced. Now we shall see what those fools do when their dear queen is nothing but a lump of ice, he roared. Then his spies brought him word of He-Man's talk with the sorceress and his hurried departure from Castle Grayskull. What can he do rushing about on that ridiculous tin horse of his, he laughed. He might have gone in search of an antidote, suggested Evil Lynn. Quiet, witch, snarled the Lord of Destruction. There is no antidote. How can you be sure, persisted Evil Lynn. Skeletor pondered. If there was an antidote to the deadly virus, it would suit his evil purpose well to get his hands on it. I have decided, he cried. I will have the antidote. Once I know its secret, I shall breed my own virus, spreading disease and death throughout Eternia. Mine shall be the triumph. And he laughed such a terrible laugh that even Evelyn shrank from him and Panthor cringed in a corner. As the sun set and the moon rose in the night sky, He-Man saw, far ahead, the cold glimmer of snow and ice. The air turned chill. Frost appeared on Stridor's metal armor, and his hooves rang on the icy ground. Very soon He-Man reached the Eternian Arctic and traveled through its ice and snow. The rocks of ice became bigger and more jagged the further He-Man went. There were bottomless crevasses in the ice which barred his way. Stridor crossed some in a single powerful leap. Others were hidden by the snow, and only the superintelligence of Stridor's bionic brain saved He-Man from destruction as the geosensors gave warning of danger underfoot. Again, He-Man paused to check his direction with the lodestone. The moon was setting and the northern lights flickered across the sky. As the changing colors sparkled from the ice, He-Man peered into the distance. Far away, a sharp peak gleamed. Crystal Mountain was in sight. But He-Man was not the only one in sight of Crystal Mountain. Separated from him by only a mile or two, a solitary creature made its way across the snow and ice. It leapt crevasses and clambered over giant rocks of ice on its lonely march to Crystal Mountain. On the edge of the ice field, Skeletor and Evelyn sat in a hovercraft and watched a video screen. In the center of the picture, the creature plodded on. Skeletor touched the controls. The picture changed. He watched Stridor picking his way carefully along the rim of yet another crevasse. <laughs> that fool and his tin horse, laughed the Lord of Destruction. Little do they know that I have prepared a welcome for them. They have been faithful guides, but my slave will outwit them yet. Gradually, the rugged surface gave way to a white expanse of level snow. Crystal Mountain filled the horizon. The lodestone pointed straight to its center, and He-Man kept his eyes on the mountain as Stridor galloped across the last few miles. He-Man was so busy concentrating on the lodestone 
that he was taken completely by surprise when, with a mighty roar, a great white shape loomed up in front of him. It was an enormous creature covered in white fur, and it rose on its hind legs and bared its huge fangs as it roared again. Stridor served to one side as the creature lunged with cruelly curved claws. As Stridor turned sharply in a swirl of powdered snow, He-Man recognized the animal as an ice hacker. It had the appearance of a giant bear. He-Man turned in the saddle and looked back. The ice hacker had gone. They had outrun it. He turned Stridor once more towards the mountain. They had barely retraced their steps when the monster again leapt out of the shadows, and again it took all of Stridor's speed and agility to avoid the attack. Where had it come from? Then He-Man realized that all it had to do was crouch against the snow, and its white fur made it invisible. He-Man turned Stridor and stopped. Then he drew his sword. Next moment, a bolt of energy sizzled across the snow. He-Man kept up his fire in a wide arc until suddenly, with a scream of panic, the ice hacker erupted from cover as a close shot singed its white fur. The ice hacker charged, but He-Man, instead of retreating, raced to meet it with a barrage of bolts from the sword. The ice hacker paused. What was this? No one and nothing had ever dared attack it before. It backed off. Then, in a final burst of fire from He-Man, it turned and fled into the night. Precious time had been lost. Stridor galloped hard, and He-Man saw a carved arch leading into Crystal Mountain. He got down from Stridor and entered. In front of He-Man, there stretched a corridor of ice. The northern lights shone through the mountain, lighting up its interior. Soon the corridor branched in several directions. For a moment, He-Man was puzzled. Then he took out the lodestone. It pointed to a corridor on his right. After following many different corridors, he found himself in a wide passage which ran straight ahead to the very heart of the mountain. At the end of the passage was a great door of curiously carved rock crystal. There was no lock or handle to be seen. He-Man put his ear to the door, but could hear nothing. He pushed with all his might, but the door stood firm. Perhaps there was a lock concealed in the carving. He looked at it closely, particularly at a strange symbol carved in the center of the door. It was the same symbol as that carved on the sorceress's lodestone. In the center of the carving was a hole, many-sided, measuring the width of a finger. He-Man took the lodestone and pushed the carved end into the hole. The mighty door swung open as the lodestone activated a magnetic lock. He-Man stood with the lodestone in his hand, amazed by what he saw. Beyond the door lay a vast circular hall under a high domed roof. Everything was crystal, and the northern lights flickered across the chamber through the walls and roof. Across the room, He-Man saw a high throne of crystal and twelve lesser thrones, six on each side. On each throne sat an aged snow dwarf. The dwarf on the larger throne called out, Who are you, and why do you disturb the peace of the elders? He-Man crossed the chamber and stood before the thrones. I am He-Man, he said, one of the masters of the universe. The queen of Eternia is ill, and I have come seeking an antidote, which only you can provide. At this, the elders looked at one another. They spoke among themselves for a moment. Then the chief elder again asked, Who are you, and why do you come here? Puzzled, He-Man again explained who he was and why he was there. You are an imposter, cried the chief elder. He-Man is already here. If you had not interrupted, we were about to give him the antidote. See! And out of the shadows stepped a figure. He-Man gasped. He thought for a moment that it might be a reflection on the crystal wall, but no, it was himself, or someone very like him. The flickering light made it difficult to make things out completely, but even through the changing colors, the figure was another He-Man. There is your imposter, cried He-Man. 
I told you he would say that, said the double. Give me the antidote. I have no time to lose if I am to save the life of the Queen of Eternia. It is a cruel trick, cried He-Man, and I see the hand of Skeletor behind it. Enough, cried the chief elder. We have heard that He-Man is the mightiest man in the universe. You will both be put to the test. Then we shall see who is the true He-Man. The chief elder ordered the servants to bring in the great chain. This, said the chief elder, is the great chain used by our ancestors to bind the terrible ice serpent which ravaged our land when Eternia was young. The chain was laid out on the floor in a straight line. You will each take an end, said the chief elder. The one who pulls the other off his feet is the true He-Man. He shall have the antidote. He-Man took a firm grip on one end of the chain. The double did the same at the other end. At a signal, they leaned back with all the power at their command. Neither man gave an inch. The chain stretched taut between them. It vibrated shrilly with the strain. Then, with a bang, it broke, so that He-Man and his opponent staggered back. It took the strength of both to break the great chain, said the chief elder. Now we shall see which one of you has the power to break it by himself. Taking both halves of the chain, the dwarfs bound He-Man and his double. Then, with one great burst of energy, He-Man was free, and the broken chain fell at his feet. A second later, his opponent was also free. He-Man looked at his double. An idea was forming in his mind. He would apply his own test. He drew the sword of power. This sword, he cried, was forged by mysterious powers in the heart of Castle Grayskull. Only a man with no evil in him may handle it unharmed. Then he turned and threw it to his double, who caught it by the hilt and brandished it over his head, unharmed. Just as He-Man expected, this was no man. This was a machine. He had encountered it before. It was one of Skeletor's androids, an electronic robot in human shape called Faker. Now He-Man turned to the elders of the Snow Dwarfs. He hung his head. You are right, he said. I am the impostor. I stole He-Man's amulet, which would identify him. Here, it is yours. Take it. And he threw the lodestone to Faker. The magnetic crystal struck the android on the chest. As its magnetic field affected Faker's electronic nervous system, the machine went out of control. The dwarfs scattered as the false He-Man staggered about the crystal hall in a cloud of smoke and showers of sparks. It collapsed in a broken heap, crackled and hissed for a moment longer, then was silent. The chief elder looked down at it thoughtfully and said, There is no doubt you are He-Man. We shall delay you no more. Here is the antidote you seek. A party of snow dwarfs escorted He-Man from the heart of Crystal Mountain. Another group dragged Faker outside and tipped the broken machine into a deep crevasse in the ice. Skeletor saw this on the video scan monitor. At every turn, I am betrayed by those who claim to serve me, he screamed. But I shall triumph in the end. You shall see. Even as the Lord of Destruction raged, Stridor was galloping swiftly and surely across the Arctic waste. The climate grew warmer, and the snow and frost became less and less. Late on the second day, He-Man came out of the evergreen forest to see the towers of Castle Grayskull rising above the River of Doom. As he crossed the jawbridge and entered the castle, the sorceress was waiting. You have done well, He-Man, she said. Now you must get the antidote to the royal palace without delay. He-Man dismounted from Stridor and leapt upon Battle Cat for the last stage of the journey. Near the palace, he changed back into Prince Adam. Battle Cat became Cringer, and together they ran up to the gates and passed the guards. Adam took the antidote straight to the doctor, and within an hour the queen was sitting up. 
Within a day or two, the cure would be complete. Adam had not yet seen his father, the king. He would do so when he had thought of an explanation for how he had found the antidote without giving away the secret of He-Man and the masters of the universe.